It's been a while since I've been this excited to go into a brand new box. You know that kid in Toy Story that got a rocket? That's exactly how I feel right now. It came! It finally came! <laughs> the big one. Hello everyone and welcome back to part 3 of this super mod art attack build. In the previous two videos I've asked you guys what you wanted to see as a powertrain for this snowmobile. The original engine is a Force Point 21 engine and it's not a bad engine but I feel like we can do much better. Unfortunately I didn't get a lot of suggestions but that turned out to be a good thing. Add Bubbles RC Shed set a Nitro RC Sled which is great because that was the plan. At RMK700-02 said to get an engine with a pull start. That's a good suggestion to save weight, but I would not mind having an electric start for the convenience. More on that later. Eric Blanchard recommended a two-cylinder such as the Toyan engines, but unfortunately those are not known to have a great power density, so I think they're out of the question. And finally, at the Action Tech said to go with an engine with a square slash rectangular heatsink. That's a great suggestion. The only engine I know that has such a feature is the OS engine GT15HZ2. So I took these four suggestions and came up with something incredible. What if I used a regular big board nitro engine that we know has a good amount of power and made a custom aluminum head that would imitate the look of a multi-cylinder triple? That's a brilliant idea. But once again, the question to start is what engine? I decided to go with the biggest nitro engine you can easily get your hands on, the HPI Savage K5.9 big block engine. This monster 0.36 cubic inch engine can produce a massive 3.75 horsepower and rev up to 39,500 RPMs. And it comes from factory with an electric drill start receiver. This is perfect as I will not have to destroy my arms to get it started and I will have all the power I need. And bonus point as that receiver is lighter as you don't have to carry the electric motor for the start. Well, now that we have decided on our engine, we need to work on the cooling head. A few years ago while making Project Meteor, I made a custom liquid cooling head for the Traxxas engine. I did the same thing once again a few years later for Project Meteor 2. I made a custom liquid cooling head that would go directly on the LRP32 engine. So from that I started from the design and made a large rectangular cooling head that takes inspiration from the OS Heli engine we talked about earlier. Then I added a few holes for the carburetor intake and the carb slide made space for the glow plugs and the fastening screws and I ended up with this beautiful piece. I might have done five or six different revisions on this before I settled on a design I liked and I printed it in plastic to test the fit. Then I did a couple more modifications to it and once I was set for my design I imported the file on PCBWay to get a quote. Made from 6061 aluminum, anodized in red, I ended up with 5 cooling heads for around $500 US. It's pretty pricey but it's beautiful. And on October 31st it finally showed up. It's been a while since I've been this excited to go into a brand new box. What the hell? Well, at least they look really good. Whew. Oh yeah. Oh, why aren't they red like they were supposed to be? In my mind, I thought I ordered the parts in red anodized, but apparently I didn't. But I think it's actually a good thing. It makes it possible to have different colors head in case I'm going for a different look. Red, purple, you name it while still having some protection from the anodizing without exposing the raw aluminum to the elements. So to solve the issue, the only thing I have to do is paint it and expose some of it. But what's the best way to mask off the areas I don't want the paint on? I thought about it long and wide and I think I came up with a pretty sick solution. 
I'm gonna be using wax or paraffin to be more precise. I will apply a thin coat on top of the fins and that way when the paint is dried all I have to do is remove that wax coating and expose the anodized aluminum underneath. Now I know what you're thinking, likely one or two things actually. The first problem could be the fact that the paint would insulate the aluminum and keep too much heat in the engine. But I don't think that's going to be an issue, because we're running in the winter and some of the snow will eventually end up near the engine and keep it cool. I also will not be painting the underside of the heatsink to leave it exposed for better heat dissipation. The second possible issue is that the paint will flake off during high and low temperature cycles, so that's the first thing I tested. I made multiple coupons of anodized aluminum that I found in a box of scraps I had and painted all of them in a different way. I ended up with two different cans of paint that I wanted to do tests with. The first contender is Apple Red Rust-Oleum Painter's Touch 2X and the other one is Krylon International Harvester Red for farm and implements. I wanted a glossy bright red finish that can withstand the high temperature of the engine head and be resistant to flaking and scratching. So I painted both coupons and after a few days I put the torch to them. I brought them to the maximum temperature a nitro engine head should be, which is around 200 Fahrenheit or 93 Celsius. I don't think the snowmobile engine will go anywhere near that, especially in the cold winter, but why not test it above and beyond. I was also interested in how the waxy coating would prevent the paint from sticking to the aluminum, so I applied a bit of wax and wiped it off after heating up the part. I had a feeling after 48 hours that the Krylon was not fully dried as the waxy transition didn't separate cleanly. After heating up both pieces past 220 Fahrenheit, they both felt well adhered to the aluminum, but the Krylon was easier to scratch. And it felt softer, dare I say gummier, while the rust was more uniform and dry. I chose to go with the latter, even though I had a soft spot for the glossiness and the color of the Krylon. After thoroughly washing the head with soap and hot water, the next step is to apply a thin coat of wax on top of the fins. But how do you apply a thin and even coat to it without having drips? You make the wax liquid and you apply it to a level surface. In this case, I found a piece of flat aluminum billet I had and I heated it up to about 80 degrees Celsius. I wanted the wax to really flow and make a level surface. I cooled the head in the refrigerator a little bit before the waxing process to make sure it doesn't heat up too quickly. I then gently applied a thin coat of wax and let it to level before making my first coat. And I quickly realized I needed a bit more thickness to the surface as it was not covering the entire plane. The second try was much more uniform, but it still had a couple of spots where it was not covered. So I dunked it a few more times quickly to try to build up the layer. I ended up with a really uniform and level wax coating on the fins, which I was really happy about. The last step before paint is to cover the glow plug holes, as I don't want any paint in them. Unfortunately, in this step, I forgot to add some green tape under the head so it doesn't have any overspray, but oh well. Nobody's gonna see it, right? I went with a single coat of paint as thick as I could without having any drips, as I didn't want the paint to be too thick, but I still want some paint in every corner to make a nice uniform finish. After 36 to 48 hours, I decided to remove the wax on top of the head using a new box cutter blade. It was honestly a pretty satisfying feeling. Once I was done, there was still a little bit of paint left, so I used a thin strip of sandpaper to remove that little coat. I wonder who placed the camera in that angle. I know it does remove some of the anodizing this way, but I'm willing to accept that. And just like that, the head came out absolutely flawless, even more beautiful than I was expecting. But we're not done, there's still a few steps to do on that engine before we can install it on the sled. I have decided to change the clutch and use something that was a bit heavier than stuck clutch. In my previous sled, I used a large aluminum flywheel from Artitac. Unfortunately, 
it will not fit this engine with its carburetor. So I went with a steel clutch from Reds Racing, the bigger 34mm one. Its increased weight and inertia will make it harder for the engine to stall when cold and it's probably one of the best flywheel slash clutch out there. I also really need to do something with that clutch belt. It still has all of that gummy old residue from the belt that melted on it. The first step is to remove the bearings with a new tool I got, a small bench dental press. I paid $160 for this bad boy and it can do up to 16 tons. Talk about a deal! Next up we need to remove the residue and the surface rust. I tried to scrape some of it off with very little success. So it was time to bring up the heat. Well, that was easy. Next up, I put to use one of my new favorite tools, the lathe. I started with 400 grit sandpaper and move up to 600 grit for a nice finishing pass. It came out beautifully. Unfortunately, the clutch is still and will rust very fast in the RC sled. So I decided to give that part a special treatment. I call it the permanent marker coating. And it is surprisingly efficient at preventing rust. In a perfect world, I would have done an oil quenching bath. But since this is a friction clutch, I don't want any oils near the clutch. By the way, these are my favorite markers. They're called Faber-Castell Grip Permanent. And I've had those for more than 6 years and they're still like new. I've had them since I made the RMK2 years ago. I highly recommend them. I was curious to know how everything weighed, so I put them all on a scale. The new red clutch weighs around 51 grams. The original HPI Savage 5.9 clutch weighs 26 grams. And the massive Art Attack aluminum flywheel was 44 grams. Without the shoes, springs and that. Now it's time to put everything together. First, we install the tapered brass cone and the clutch assembly. Then, we put the bearings back in the clutch bell and we install it on the engine. Then, we add a washer and finally, the belt guide. The original one was quite crusty, so I turned out a brand new one on the lathe and it was a much nicer fit. And finally, the cherry on top, a titanium clutch screw from JNT bearings. It might be a bit unnecessary, but it's looking great, and I want it on the sled. Now let's see what it looks like installed on the sled. I think the power plant on that sled came out perfectly. I don't think I could have come up with something nicer. A big bore, big power nitro engine that looks like an old vintage triple. What else could you ask for? I think I will stop the video here for this week. Don't worry, there's still a lot more cool stuff coming up for this build that you really don't want to miss on. If you have any suggestions for this super mod sled, please leave them down below. With that being said, thanks for watching the video and thanks for riding with me.